So, CPU bug and the modern music teacher. Um, obviously, we are the modern music teacher. Um, and is it just that? So, just a brief um, look at CPU bug. So, his date is 1714 to 1788. So, this puts his relevance into the um, Gallant area. So, we're taught where where the crossover between Baroque and classical. Um, he is the son of Johann Sebastian Bach. He he had got a law degree, and he worked as harpsichordist for Frederick the Great. And for those who who have been to other of the the talks, you would um, know that Quantz worked with Frederick the Great. So um, Frederick the Great had a great love of music, and his court was in the style antico so he was holding on to the old traditions it wasn't a very progressive court musically that is so he's he's worked as a harpsichord in a, a traditional environment and and he obviously is this composer in this transition between baroque and classical so the, the treatise is divided into two parts the first part was published in 1753 and it talks about fingering, embellishments and performance. And part two, which we're not going to talk about today, was published in 1762. And it talks about counterpoint and composition and resembles a modern theory textbook in many ways. Um, so this particular treatise is, is important because it was studied by Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven. So, you know, this means if we're playing Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven, we have this gives us some insight into what might be appropriate performance style for them and this particular treatise was not so localized it it sold all around europe so it had a, a, a quite a large impact and many treatises that come after this treatise refer to it or reflect the information in it it's obviously aimed at, at keyboard players so there's very specific keyboard instructions which won't be relevant but i'm going to to everyone but i'll mention them anyway and it introduces this new practice of putting the thumb under so to explain that that before the thumb went under you might use four fingers then four fingers but you didn't have any way to make them legato this wasn't so important when we're dealing with the rhetoric of the early baroque where the music was supposed to be divided into these sort of words and units and there was varied articulation and so the use of the thumb wasn't so significant but the fact that this this passing under the thumb was something that was used by Bar J.S. Bach himself as a new technique tells us that this move is going towards that that long phrase that legato phrase which becomes so vital in the cla in classical music so he, he talks about why he wrote his book, and I chuckle because this could be me giving a lecture on the current state of teaching in my area or or, or wherever. Um, so he says, keyboard instruction has lacked three elements, correct fingering, good embellishments, and good performance. The tone lacks roundness and clarity and sounds like thumping and stumbling. And students have been taught wrong hand positions and finger technique, which has led to stiffness. And students left hand, left hands have been left to the role of just thumping. So it probably applies to 50% of the transfer students that come to our studios when they start, right? So I, I, I think it's funny that nothing has changed, but I also find it insightful that we have so much anatomical knowledge that wasn't available then. And yet, even then, they knew the importance of having a finger technique that did not lead to stiffness. So uh, he, he talks about his father and he talks about his father with a lot of respect, even though in, in Johann Sebastian Bach's day, he wasn't respected as being some amazing Baroque composer. He was, he was an old fuddy-duddy who was very good at improvising, um, but his fame, so to speak, was very localised. And um, the respect we give him now is completely out of proportion with the respect he had in his own life's, lifetime. I don't mean that to say he was disrespected but he wasn't regarded as the genius that we see him in the same way um but he, obviously his sons held him in high regard and it, as as is evident in, in the writing but he talks about how his father devised this fingering that incorporates a more free use of the thumb and before J.S. Bach the um, performers were only incorporating thumbs for big stretches 
those who watch the Cooperon le- lecture might remember that Cooperon spent a lot of time talking about the thumb under as well. So it seems like these guys are the um, oh, I, I don't know the word I, I want, like the protesters or something, trying to bring in something new. Yeah, look at this thumb passing under. This is so amazing. And so that that was something that, and that's something to think about when we play Baroque music earlier than J.S. Bach, that the, because the thumb wasn't involved, that limits the the legato ness that it's capable capable of. So, um, these are the rules that um, CPE Bach lists for piano. Poor performers must sit the middle of the keyboard, and the forearms should be suspended slightly over the keyboard. The fingers should be arched, and the muscles should be relaxed. Um, and then he says that the correct correct fingering can most readily be practiced through scales. So if there's a student listening to this who thinks, I don't need to practice my scales, just think, CP Bach says this is the best way to learn correct fingering. Um, and he says black key should seldom be taken by the little finger and only when necess- necessary by the thumb. Um, I, I term this as the emergency you can only use a thumb on a black key in case of emergency. So he he introduces what were new fingering principles. Using alternate fingers on repeated notes for a more effective legato. And again, it's just funny that this is new. This is something that we we think about as just standard, but this was this was um, his new ideas in this day. Uh, Arpeggiated and leaping passages should be played according to the rules of fingering. But however, sometimes a slight change of fingering is required for a broken chord in its musical context. Um, and the advantage, of course, of this thumb movement is that it avoids forcing and distorting the hand shape. And and he, he talks about incorrect fingering as distorting the hand shape and giving no opportunity for the muscles to relax. And um, I don't know who in this room has seen that where a student has come and they've actually got some physical injury because of um, poor fingering technique and poor position of the hands. So right back here, we're saying don't distort the hand shape. Yet the muscles need a chance to relax. So that embellishment. So we're at the end, we're, we're coming to the end of the era where everything was embellished. Um, and but he, he talks about embellishments in slightly different way to early treatises. So he, he, embellishments connect and enliven tones and bring stress and accent and they heighten expression. Without born embellishments, the, the best melody becomes empty and ineffective. He, he points out that the French notate their ornaments with painstaking accuracy. You think of the Hotter suites where he has tables of um, how he wants the trills to be played that how it that wasn't in in other cultures in the same insistence I can't think of the word I want um the the Germans use moderation with respect to the number of ornaments so um French Baroque music doesn't appear all that often in syllabus I noticed that Trinity seems to try and include some French Baroque music in their about grade six level books each time they've come out um at least the ones I've seen. And I think that's it's it's so such a different style French Baroque music, um, and they they did ha- use a lot more symbols. They had a lot more symbols like the Port of Wire and things like that that weren't um, notated or na- named in the German um, embellishment system. Um, And he says it's important not to disturb the affect of the piece when adding embellishments. And so affect, the doctrine of affects, which which was starting to go out of vogue, um, but the doctrine of affects is that a piece had an emotion. This emotion was connected with the key that you picked for the piece. So if you wanted it to have a pastoral emotion, you'd pick F major, for instance, or if you want it to be militant, you might pick A major. Um, so and d- different treatises would assign different affects to different keys. So it's not like you can say always when a composer uses E minor, they're thinking of this. Yeah. Um, but there, there was this definite feeling that a key influenced what the, the emotion of the piece was. That was also linked to the fact that they didn't have equal temperament. So this idea of an omnitonic system where pieces can just be transposed without changing colour, that was not available to them at all. 
D major had a different flavoring to C major due to the spacing of and the sizes of the tones and semitones in that scale under their tuning systems and there was multiple tuning systems but back to what CP is saying when embellishments are added you don't want to change the effect so if you've got a piece that's sad you don't want to embellish it in a way that it no longer sounds sad um, and he, he specifically says that music that represents simplicity or sadness would have less ornaments than that which is bright. Um, he, he used the word prodigal, so I wouldn't have used it this way, but he did, so I left it there. A prodigal use of embellishments must be avoided. Regard them as spices which may ruin the best dish. And they can be so tempting. And when we're playing Baroque to go crazy on the embellishments and, and a lot of performers do. And by this stage, he's advising against it. And he, he, he criticizes the fact that some instruments indicate everything with only a few ornamental signs and therefore the signs become ambiguous in meaning. So um, if I think of like Blavo Sonata, he, he marked every um, ornament with a plus and so the all, the plus starts to lose its meaning because what sort of ornament is it and so he's now saying need to be more specific with um, the signs that are used to make the composer's intentions more clear he says that the primary aim of embellishments is to connect notes so if you use a short ornament continue holding the note until it's it's finished so in other words if there's a mordant don't play the mordant and then cut the note short and leave a space um if again if you're playing music that history just applies to um he says the the small notes and by this he means the apoduturas must be played with the bass note so in other words on the beat um cp bark um added ornament symbols as he didn't feel the French, oh, so he, he actually um, added his own sets of ornament symbols because he didn't feel the French ornaments covered everything that the German style required. And he and the German style, if you remember what Quant said about the German style, that it was perfection because it took the best elements of Italian and French style and, and fused them to make the German style. Um, so C.P. Bach talks about this as well. So the German style is a, a fusion of it Italian bel canto elements and French style. Um, also note, if you are you playing something by C.P. Bach, that he specifically says that the explanations for the ornaments in his sonatas were not added by him. They were added by the publisher and they're wrong. <laughs> so um, be warned, um, if you're playing something by him, check his graphs in the, in the treatise rather than relying on what the publisher put there. So, um, apoduturas, uh, uh, this, he, he, he contradicts himself a little bit, um, and I've left that there. But if, if we remember from Quance, the, the apoduturas would, would take a half or two thirds of the value of the following note. Um, so if it's a minimum tide, it might take the, a minimum tide with a crotchet, it might take that full minimum, um, not, not two thirds of the minimum, but two thirds of the value plus the tie, what it's tied to. Um, but they were all written the same. So, um, so he says a few things about this. He says we mark th with the note of the actual duration. So if the if the note is a dotted minimum and we want the appoggiatura to be two thirds, we mark it as a minimum appoggiatura. And I, I, I guess that there may have been some regional differences in how appoggiaturas were interpreted. And so he feels it needs to be more clear. And he says of appoggiaturas that they're louder than the following tone. He also still um, repeats Quance's instruction that the apoditories take a half or two thirds of the value of the written note, unless it forms an unpleasant dissonance with the bass note or if it creates open fifths. So the, the main difference is not in the interpretation, but in how they're written. Um, and he said all voice leading rules will apply to the interpretation of apoditories. But if there are too many apoduturas, it can weaken the melody and cause it to sound insipid unless the apoduture is combined with something else. Um, with, a, with, as he says, a livelier audience, and I'm pretty sure I spelled livelier wrong there. Um, he also says it is wrong to place 
a descending appoggiatura before the final note of a cadence when the final tone is preceded by a trill without an appoggiatura. That's a bit complicated. Maybe I shouldn't have included that in there. Um, so um, I guess that's a comp more compositional. Um, he says, never separate the appoggiatura from the following tone. And I think that's still common practice. Um, the unaccented passing appoggiatura in his day, so is currently popular, but is more agreeable before the beat. Again, that, that, that concurs with quant. So if, the, if it's a passing appoggiatura, then it's before the beat. But all other appoggiaturas are with the bass note. So, and when he talks about trills, he says trills enliven melodies. Um, and if we think earlier, the, the purpose of the trill in particular was often to lengthen notes because the notes would um, decay too quickly. So if you needed a long note, it needed to be trilled to sustain its, its volume. So trills had a few purposes in early music. So in here that, and he says in, in the has gone past, trills were preceded by an appoggiatura, but today they use both in stepwise and leaping passages in succession at cadences and on long notes. And he, he says trills always begin on the upper note. Um, and then he talks about the suffix, so the, the, the two notes that are added to the end of the trill. And he says trills on long notes are played with a su suffix regardless of whether it goes up or down at the end of the trill. So again, this is this is reasonably new. This is not in, in earlier instructions. Um, the, the suffix has gained importance. Um, he, he says a suffix can also be added to a trill that follow, is followed by a leap. And he says suffixes work better when the trill ends with one note higher than if the following is one note lower. Again, this sort of contradicts what he's just said, that basically you should use the suffix um, most of the time. <laughs> Um, he, he points out the suffix must be played as fast as a trill. So if our students are arguing with us about um, they want to slow down the suffix, we can we can point to CPE. Um, the suffix keeps the spill the, the same speed. And the unsuffixed trill is best used in descending succession. So that does concur with what he said earlier. Um, he says, avoid any trills that destroy the legato feel of the mod melodic line. And then he says, here's some common errors. One is adding a suffix to a short trill or failing to give a trill its full length, plunging into the trill without playing an appoggiatura first and performing a trill loudly in a subdued plaintive context. Uh, a dear friend of mine often says that when you do an accent or an ornament, it needs to match the countryside. So if you're in the country, you know, you might add something here, but you don't want some huge big McDonald's in the middle of a farm. Um, it, it just is out of context. So the same thing, whatever we do needs to match the countryside. So an accent needs to be appropriate to what's around it. A trill needs to be appropriate to what's around it. It can't be like a McDonald's thrown in the middle of the Gundagai or something. there is a McDonald's in Gundagai, but like in the middle of a beautiful country farm or something. And there's this, this big thing there. So, um, then he says, I just read that putting a trill on every long note is an error. So, and, and that can be very tempting, particularly for students when we say you can ornament where you like, and they like to ornament every single long note. Um, he says, avoid turns on very short notes, but turns are sometimes used in combination with a short trill. And, and we're, we're sort of lucky that, if you call it luck, the ed editors are often, these days, editors are often musicologists with a specialty in the area for the book that they're, they're editing. And so they, they will suggest when a trill should have a trill plus a turn. Um, the turn sounds better if the music's moving upwards. So remember, the downward, there was no suffix on the trill. Moving upward, turns work well. Um, mordants are used to fill out sustained notes and they add brilliance to leaping detached notes. 
Morden's probably my favorite ornament. But anyway, he calls the compound appoggiatura is the term he uses for a two note appoggiatura. And it's, he says it serves to connect notes and fill them out. If we go back to the Ganassi treatise, we know that when we had an interval, it was quite common to use a passaggi to fill it out. So here, that's the purpose of this compound appoggiatura is to, to fill in in a leaf. And then a slide, which the way he describes it seems to be very similar to what he referred to as a compound appoggiatura, is a two note ascending appoggiatura used to fill in the leap. Um, and then a fermata over notes and rests indicates a small embellishment passage. I've read this, I thought, how do we apply this? Um, when do we know when a fermata is just a pause or when we should do a small embellishing passage as part of the fermata? So that's, that's a question that I wasn't quite sure how to apply, but I've put it there because he said it. Um, performance. So f I love this comment. All my students have to know about this. I tell them that the word fast is a swear word um, because only slow is not a swear word. And um, so CP said the same thing, but much nicer. He says finger velocity is important, but not at the expense of musical phrasing. And he says, a good performance will express the effect, affect of the composition, the mood of the composition. So that the importance of communicating with the audience in a good performance. Um, brisk allegros are expressed by detached notes and tender adagios by broad slurred notes. That's consistent with what, what went before. So, um, and no, I, I, I won't delve into that deeper. So notes and rests must be given their exact value. However, manipulations of the tempo are permissible in solo or small ensemble and can be exceptionally beautiful. Um, this is a little bit interesting because it's not, this, this is a change where notes could be given shorter values and shortened and then extended the rest or notes could be extended into a rest and, and, and push the rest out of the way. Um, but yes, so he's, it sounds like he's talking more about a rubato here. Uh, one must feel the emotional mood of the piece when performing it. And a long affectuoso note is to be played with vibrato, a, a gentle shaking of the finger that is pressing the key. Obviously not quite something we can achieve on um, our modern piano. Um, the two note slurs he talks about this this one is one that i think i often see overused in um in examinations the first note of each slur is slightly accented if there is a staccato dot at the end of the slur then this the last note of each slur is detached notice it's if there is a staccato dot it's not just at the end of the two note slur detach it um short notes that are followed by a dotted note are always detached and then this one is something he says i would be very very reluctant to use it in the exam room um but when there are triplets this is how they should align with a dotted semi-quaver quaver so instead of marking this as a triplet it's marked as though it's divisible by four but it's played as though it's divisible by three he notice that they're aligned. This, this concurs with Leopold Mozart's treatise on the interpretation of this rhythm. But I, there are pieces that we teach that are commonly played that are contemporary with this treatise, but they are commonly played with this quaver being after the triplet. And so it, it, may, it makes me think that if we are performing it in an exam, the examiner might think it sounds strange if they don't know about this or in a, in a competition or anything they don't know about this particular treatise and this particular state statement they might hear it as being a wrong rhythm or a wrong note so it's there i would be cautious to use it um I'd be very careful about using it in a in a performance the use of rubato so avoid excessive ritardando, which make the tempo drag. This is also a common fault with students. I find that 
they want to be expressive and they want to do a ritardando, but the, the piece almost comes to a halt. There's always got to be that feeling that the, the momentum of the piece is continuing, even if the speed is a little bit flexible. He says that the tempo at the end of the piece must be exactly the same as the tempo at the beginning. Um, now, this, this, is, this is also a bit interesting. So when playing rubato, the left hand plays in strict time. The other hand varies and is flexible. Um, I've heard that this is what Mozart did as well, but I am yet to figure out how that would work in practice because my two hands don't want to have one doing rubato and one not. But that is specifically what is said. And he says that most keyboard pieces contain rubato. So we're looking end of Baroque, beginning of classical, and he's saying most keyboard pieces have rubato. So they're, they're, they're misnomer that there's no rubato in the Baroque era um, is actually quite incorrect. There was. Exactly how it was expressed was not, it was not the same as romantic rubato, but it was still part of it. I, I liked this, fortes must not be flogged. <laughs> and um, and this notes that do not belong to the key may well be emphasised. And so we did know this from earlier. The, the chromatic notes that don't belong to the key are very expressive and dramatic. And I, I learned recently that chroma is, is the suffix for colour. So this, the chromatic notes are colourful and they, they should be emphasised and brought out. So, or he says may well be, maybe not should be, but may well be. And my last slide was just briefly mentioning on part two, it's really similar to reading a modern theory book. It goes through all the rules. It talks about all the different harmonic combinations that you can use. And um, it discusses how to use figured bass to create an accompaniment. So if you are interested in, in understanding figured bass, um, CPE goes, quite deeply into it. Now, what I will do, I'm going to stop the live stream so that anybody who wants to say something can say something. So I'm still sharing screen, I'm trying to figure out how to stop. So if you want to, if you're on live stream and you want to come and join us, do join the room and you can ask any questions you have. Um, and otherwise, I live stream people, I will see later.